Let's pray. Father, we come to you in the name of your Son, Jesus. We pray, God, that you would help us this morning to receive your word as your truth, to be able to apply it and live it, to not keep it to ourselves. So much brokenness in the world. Please help us to be a light, to speak the truth in love. I do pray, Lord, that this morning you would help me to communicate this truth and love with which it is intended, compassion, gentleness, at the same time firmness, truth, and conviction, boldness, not because of my opinion, our opinions, but because of your truth and what it says. Please give grace this morning to those who do not know you, to give them a new heart, a heart of flesh, to receive your word, to be saved, to have forgiveness, salvation, times of refreshing in their lives, deliver them from bondage. Lord, help me in my weakness to, to preach this message that is so important and so relevant to our time. And we pray this in the name of Christ, Jesus our Lord and our Savior. Amen. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. I want to step aside from 1 John today for one Sunday and to preach a topical sermon, a very particular topic, uh, and if you'd like, take notes. The title is A Biblical Understanding of Sexuality. A Biblical Understanding of Sexuality. As you know or may know, uh, June has been designated as Pride Month. Pride Month is when the LGBTQ community uh, celebrates and openly flaunts, uh, along with their supporters, their sexuality through various different organized events, primarily through parades. And I believe one such parade will be held here in Santa Fe at the end of this month. Uh, this is also a month, according to LGBTQ advocates, where support is raised and awareness is raised uh, for this uh, community to continue the fight for equality in the workplace, equality in sports, and adoption of children, and also in other places. In case you're not aware, the L stands for lesbian, when a biological female uh, is attracted to a biological female. The G stands for gay. The B stands for bisexual. The T for transgender. And the Q for queer, which to the best of my understanding is when you don't really know at this point which one you identify with. And they keep adding letters onto this uh, every time they invent a new gender identity when a particular um, letter or, you know, a particular, um, what, what, what's the word I'm looking for, um, category doesn't fit what they identify as. And so I read in an article that there are over 50 options at this point, uh, over 50 letters of uh, genders. And you might be saying, well, how can there be so many options? I thought there were only two genders, uh, male and female. And here's what you have to understand. Up until a few decades ago, the sex, male and female, was synonymous with the gender. But that is no longer the case. That a person is born biologically male or biologically female is hard to ignore. 
And so what they had to do is to make a distinction between the sex and what gender is, or gender identity. According to Planned Parenthood, an article, I want to read you some sections here that kind of explain this in their own terms, okay? There's a lot more to being male, female, or any gender than the sex assigned at birth. Your biological or assigned sex does not always tell your complete story. Well, what is the difference between sex, gender, and gender identity? It's common for people to confuse sex, gender, and gender identity, but they are actually all different things. Sex is a label, male or female, that you're assigned by a doctor at birth based on the genitals you're born with and the chromosomes you have. It goes on your birth certificate. By the way, the sex is assigned by God, not a doctor. Gender is much more complex. It's a social and legal status and set of expectations from society about behaviors, characteristics, and thoughts. Each culture has a standard about the way that people should behave based on their gender. This is also generally male or female, but instead of being about body parts, it's more about how you're expected to act because of your sex. Gender identity is how you feel inside and how you express your gender, what you feel, through clothing, behavior, and personal appearances. And it's a feeling that begins very early in life. The article goes on. Your gender identity, how you feel inside, and how you express those feelings, clothing, appearance, behavior, all of these things, They are things that begin early in life, as it says, and it says here, your feelings about your gender identity begin as early as the age of two or three. Now, gender identity, according to Planned Parenthood, which I would say reflects their definitions well, is a feeling. It's how you feel inside. I remind us, Jeremiah says, God says, that the heart is deceitfully wicked, desperately wicked, above all things. None can understand it. The heart, the feelings are deceived in our fallen nature. These feelings, they begin as early as the age of two or three. Well, now you know why children in elementary school, maybe earlier, are being told that they can choose whatever gender they want to be. Should we be surprised when little children who don't even know what their feelings are, if they're told that, they begin to just say, hey, that's neat, let me be that. This is why children are being told in school that they can begin to transition from being male to female, female to male, all while keeping this a secret from their parents. One article, one headline reads this, Major children's clothing retailers poured money into LGBT group that promotes secret gender transitions for children. Someone once uh, sent me this. Someone sent me this uh, last night. This is from yesterday, I believe. New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham signs law permitting minors access to sex change care and abortions without parental knowledge or consent. That's yesterday. This is the world we live in. To put that into perspective, someone commented on that. Quote, but parents still need to sign a waiver for that kid to go to a school field, uh, field trip to the planetarium. We live in a clown world. That's what this person said. It's insanity. It's lunacy. One headline, or excuse me, moving on. This is more than, so this is more than some adult month of events, Pride Month. Okay, They are coming after children now. And I believe this is why this year the backlash on this is so big. 
It's no longer about you're an adult, you're going to sin that way, fine. Now they're trying to go after kids. Not trying, they are. They're going after children. If you go to Target, I haven't gone there, but I read online, there's a, a section promoting children's LGBTQ acceptance. If you go to Kohl's, they sell onesies, at least online, for four-month-olds that, that promote transgenderism. Legos that I grew up playing with are promoting it. This month, countless companies are succumbing to this. Schools and libraries are pushing kids' books intended to instruct them from an early age on sex and gender identity. In fact, a week ago, uh, my, my kids love to go to the library, and they just pick books that seem okay, and then we, re we look through them to make sure they're okay. Well, right there in one of the pages, two women getting married. My daughter's five. As you all know, I've said this many times, Disney has been making movies with LGBTQ characters. The show Arthur that I grew up watching, many of you maybe, Arthur had a gay wedding. Blue's Clues believes promotes lesbianism. This is not a month. This is a movement. This is a movement. And in the last decade in particular, it has begun to spread faster and faster, not only across this nation, but across the world. If you go online, even Israel is having pride parades right now. And that's just one of the countries. There's many others. To be honest, the level of death, I, I, I dove into this this week, has been very depressing. It's very depressing. And you can probably tell this is more of a lecture now. It's not really so much a sermon, but it needs to be, it needs to be said. You see that the argument is this. Parents don't know what is right for their kids. The school does. The government does. And so we need to protect the children from their parents. Hey, let's keep it a secret. Okay? And let's make laws now where they can go and get that transition, that surgery that's going to alter their life forever without parental knowledge or consent. That's child abuse, by the way. It's child mutilation. But it goes beyond this as LGBTQ married couples, quote-unquote, have legal access to adopt children. I read one article I haven't verified, but it says one in three LGBTQ families have adopted children. It's an ever-evolving community, far-reaching impact, and again, beyond the individuals themselves, now this is impacting businesses, schools, the workplace, sports, and even the church. Even the church. And this can all be so confusing, right? <laughs> this is being pushed in our face day after day after day. can be so confusing. And so this morning, what I want to do is to bring some biblical clarity to the subject to tell us and instruct us, how, how can we respond? How must we act as Christians in this context? And I think the best way to do that this morning is to give you some headings, to break this up, and just to help us think through it. And the first heading is this. What the Bible says about sex and gender. What the Bible says about sex and gender. When you look at Scripture, the Bible does not make any sort of distinction between sex, male and female, or gender. They're synonymous terms in the Bible. In Genesis 1.27, it says this, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. So there are only two options. Biblically speaking, male 
and female, and the doctor does not tell you what you are at birth, God has determined that well before you were ever born. God assigns the sex. The closest thing we have in the Bible to a gender identity or confusion about one's gender is probably Deuteronomy 22 and verse 5. Deuteronomy 22 verse 5 says this, A woman shall not wear man's clothing, nor shall a man put on woman's clothing. For whoever does these things is an abomination to the Lord your God. That's what is called a transvestite. uh, When you dress in the opposite sex's clothing. And that's often the, the first step toward transitioning, or one of the steps, is you begin to dress with what you identify as. Are there gender roles in the Bible? Of course there are. The Bible tells us there are gender roles, but they correspond to what? To the sex, right? God has said the men have manly tasks, certain tasks they perform. Women have womanly tasks, tasks that they perform, and they correspond with the sex of the person. And this is why the terms are synonymous. And so the point, biblically speaking, is that there are only two sexes, two genders, and that's it. That there is no third, fourth, fiftieth option that the Bible gives us. Do we see these other options in the Bible? I would say probably in one place that Mike read for us in Romans 1, in verse 30. Inventors of evil. Inventors of evil. That's the only thing that comes to my mind. Okay? If one letter or if one category doesn't match exactly what you think you might be or identify with, well, let's just make a new category. Let's invent something new. Only two sexes, two genders. Biblically speaking, the second heading I want to give you is what the Bible says about marriage. What the Bible says about marriage. On June 26, 2015, Barack Obama tweeted this, Today is a big step in our march toward equality. Gay and lesbian couples now have the right to marry just like everyone else. Hashtag love wins. Love wins. Men can marry men, women can marry women, just like everyone else. And today we see same-sex couples with, with legitimate marriages in the eyes of the government and legitimate benefits from the government as a married couple status. The question for us as Christians is this. Does God, does God accept that as a legitimate marriage? And the answer is no. The answer is no. In the eyes of God, this is no marriage. Genesis 2.22-24 through 24 says this. Genesis 2.22-24 through 24. The Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had made or taken from the man and brought her to the man. And the man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and his mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And so God clearly and definitively at creation defines marriage as a lifelong covenant union between a biological male and a biological female. That's marriage in the eyes of God. Anything that stands outside of that definition is not marriage according to the Scriptures, according to what God has to say. And so I just want to put it bluntly here. There is no such thing as same-sex marriage. There's no such thing. And this is why, by the way, 
People ask sometimes, is it sinful for me to attend a gay wedding, a homosexual wedding, a lesbian wedding? The answer is yes. It is sinful. Why? Because what is a wedding? You're celebrating the union between one man and one woman. It's a celebration of God's created order. And so by your presence, what you're doing is you're affirming that. You're celebrating along with the crowd. It is sin. Unless you're there to object, to object, when the person marrying the the two people says, is there anyone here that objects? It is sin to attend and to celebrate same-sex marriage. Same issue with the whole thing about baking a cake that's going on in Colorado. Why is that a sin? Why, why is that man not making a cake for a same-sex marriage? Well, because that's part of the celebration. That's part of the celebration. Does that apply to everything? Are we not to, in our jobs, uh, offer services to people who are LGBTQ? No, I'm not saying that at all. But, but with marriage, with all of these things that celebrate that, that's different. That's different. You're affirming that by your presence. The purpose of marriage is this. To have a complementary relationship with a person from the opposite sex through life. A companionship. It is, number two, to procreate. To have children. To multiply and fill the earth. And number three, it is a picture of Christ and His bride, the church, Ephesians 5. So anything outside of a biblical definition of marriage does not fulfill this God-ordained purpose. Number three, third heading. What the Bible says about same-sex relationships. The Bible doesn't have much to say about the various different gender identities. However, the Bible has much to say about same-sex Illicit sexual relationships between two people of the opposite sex. Scripture does not whisper about this like one prominent pastor recently said, or a few months ago. The Bible has much to say on this topic, saints. It has much to say on this. And Scripture in no uncertain terms says that homosexuality Lesbianism and everything else is a sin. It is sin. Because it's a violation of God's law. It's a violation and perversion of God's will and a deviation from His created order and purpose. Let me give you some scriptures. Old Testament. Leviticus 18.22 Leviticus 18.22 You shall not lie, that is, sleep with or have relations with in the context with a male as one lies with a female. It is an abomination to the Lord. Not many sins in the Bible are called an abomination to God. This is one of them. The the word abomination is something which causes horror and disgust and is repulsive to God. That's what the word means. It is an abomination to the Lord. Leviticus 20.13 says this, If there is a man who lies with a male as those who lie with a woman, both them have committed a detestable act. They shall surely be put to death. Their blood guiltiness is upon them. So in the Old Testament, under the Old Testament national law for Israel, this is a sin that was punishable by death. But by the way, so was breaking the Sabbath, so was adultery, so was cursing your parents, hitting your parents. And so whoever's listening or watching online, what I'm not saying is that that applies today. And, and thank goodness. Thank goodness. But what, what, that, what that's stressing is the seriousness of the sin in the eyes of God. The seriousness of the sin 
in the eyes of God. As Mike read for us, all that list of sins, at the end it says that all those who practice these things are deserving of death. Not just these sins, but even lying and stealing and all these things. All sins deserve death. The wages of sin is death. And by the way, the the fact that God had to give so many laws pertaining to sexuality and sex relationships, it shows how sexually perverted the world had become by that point. Because there's laws against bestiality, laws against incest, laws against, you know, all these kind of things. All of these particular sins. And pagan nations would often have what were called male called prostitutes. And these were men who were engaged in part in homosexual acts as a part of worshiping false gods. And eventually, these were also found in the nation of Israel itself. In the reign of Rehoboam, Solomon's son, when Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, we read in 1 Kings 14.24, 1 Kings 14.24, there were also male called prostitutes in the land, and they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord dispossessed before the sons of Israel. And I read somewhere that part of that also included pedophilia. And by the way, if you think this is where it's going to stop, no, it's getting to that point in the future. Of course, the most famous example in the Old Testament is that of Sodom and Gomorrah. The two angels, who were in the form of men, entered the house of Lot. They were sent there to destroy the cities because we're told in Genesis that the city had exceeding wickedness. And while the men, those two angels, were in Lot's house, it says in Genesis 19.5, that before they lay down, the men of the city, the men of Sodom, surrounded the house, both young and old. This sin had permeated the entire culture. All the people from every quarter. And they called to Lot and said to him, Where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us that we may have relations with them. Sexual relations. Men saying, where are the men? Bring them out. This was going to be a sexual violation of these two angels. Didn't know they were angels. And so extreme and prevalent was this sin that God judged Sodom and Gomorrah with brimstone and fire from heaven, as it says in Genesis 19.24. And as you may know, Sodom and Gomorrah then became an illustration throughout the Old and New Testament of God's judgment upon sin. New Testament, Romans 1, 26-27, again, which Mike read, For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged the natural function for that which is unnatural, And in the same way also, the man abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another, men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their errors. 1 Timothy 1, verses 9 and 10. 1 Timothy 1, verses 9 and 10. Realizing the fact that law is not made for a righteous person, but for those who are lawless and rebellious for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who kill their fathers or mothers, for murderers, for immoral men and homosexuals and kidnappers and liars and perjurers and whatever else is contrary to sound teaching. There's no way around it when we look at the Bible honestly Anything outside of a biblical definition of marriage and a sexual relationship is a sin. It's a sin. Number four, a question. 
How did we get here? How did we get here? A few months ago, one of the elders received a phone call from a, a quote-unquote LGBTQ church asking us if we are accepting and affirming of the LGBTQ community. And we said, no, we're not. Because accepting and affirming, what that means when you translate it is, I accept your sin and I tolerate your sin and I am affirming it. I'm affirming it. But what we are is welcoming. We welcome all people to come to this church and hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because all people, no matter what their sin is, no matter what their past is, they can be forgiven in Christ. Every sin. The only reason I'm talking specifically about this sin is because it's so prevalent today. This is the issue. But LGBTQ is not the issue. It is just one symptom of a sinful heart. It's just one of many sins. We all need Christ. We all need forgiveness. We all need to be washed and cleansed. And so please don't, don't receive this as a hateful attack of some sort. We need to just have a biblical understanding so that people might see their need for a Savior, for cleansing, for forgiveness. As I said at the beginning, this made its way into the church, religion. And many biblical leaders and theologians and preachers who at one point may have been okay and, and, and sound are not affirming this thing. They're caving into the culture and its demands of affirming and accepting this. One such person a long time ago is Max Lucado, famous author, who went back on what he used to say about homosexuality because the pressure got to him. There are well-known theologians. This is public knowledge. That's the only reason I give names. It's public knowledge. There are theologians that are caving into this. But it's sin. <clears throat> and by the way, I want to say this here. There are other theologians that say it's not sinful to have a same-sex attraction as long as you don't act on it. It's still sinful. It's still sinful. Because what they do is they equate, well, aren't men attracted to women? So isn't that sinful? No, here's the difference. That's natural. That's natural. Can that lead into sinful thoughts? Yes. But, but men are attracted to women, women to men. That's how God created it. Attraction to the opposite sex, when you define it, it's an evil desire. It's an evil desire. Remember what Jesus said. It's about the heart. It's not if you look at a woman, or it's not if you commit the act. If you so look at a woman, commit adultery in your heart, you've already committed adultery. But with this, it goes beyond that. We are attracted to something that is unnatural outside of God's created order. Sinful. So how is it that our culture turned to, to such a, a sexual state of affair? How is it that just as in the nation of Israel, now in the church we see this even? The same way it has happened in the past. People are turning from God. God is turning from them. He gave them over to a debased mind. He gave them over to do what they want to do. He gave them. You have to understand what we see happening in this nation and the world is the wrath of God. We often think of wrath, fire, brimstone. Not always. Romans 1 says in verse 18, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven right now. It is being revealed. How is it being revealed? He's letting people go their way and do what they think they, they want to do. He's letting them go in their sin. That's the wrath of God. And this is a consequence of rejecting God, the Creator, and rejecting His created order. Right? Because in Genesis 1 and 2, God creates people, male and female. He creates marriage and the gender roles. Well, what does Satan want to do? He wants to twist that and pervert it. 
That's what's happening. But let's not for a moment believe that God has lost control. This is God's doing. This is the wrath of God. You want to reject God as creator? You want to reject him and worship idols? Go ahead. What's the result? Confusion, insanity, immorality of every sort. This is, this is wrath, saints. It's wrath. The abandonment of God upon people. There in Romans it says, you know, while they claimed to be wise, they became fools. Okay? But what we hear today, a lot of what we hear today is, well, there's more science. <laughs> we have more knowledge about this. Right? The Bible's wrong. Okay? We're wiser. <laughs> no, you've become a fool. You've become a fool. And by the way, in Romans 1.32, it says that it's not just those who are doing these things that are guilty, but those who approve of these things who are guilty. Those who watch on and celebrate are guilty. Number five, what is the consequence? What is the consequence? Where do LGBTQ people go who do not repent and believe in Jesus Christ for forgiveness? Where do they end up eternally? 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 and 10. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate. Notice, not just homosexuality. Nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Do not be deceived. I looked online, and, and these, these advocate groups, they have their own theologians who claim to be Christians. And what are they doing? They're explaining all these key passages that I'm giving to you, reinterpreting them, and saying, no, the Bible actually supports this. It supports homosexuality. You're leading yourself astray. It's a deception of the heart to think you can live in unrestrained, unrepented sin and inherit the kingdom of God. The opposite of inheriting God's kingdom is hell. There are two options. No purgatory. People can deny this all day long. This is not my opinion. This is the word of God. And you can deny it, and you can deny it, and deny it. But what will you do in the end? What will you do when you die and you stand before God? I'm trying to help. What will you do when you die and you stand before God? Six, how do we respond? How do we respond? What are we to do as Christians? How, how are we to respond? Many of us have family members who are in this particular sin. Many of us have friends in this particular sin. Neighbors, people we know at work in this particular sins. How are we to reach out to them? How are we to love them? How are we to speak to them? I want to try to give you some, some, some wisdom, I hope, from the Word of God. Okay? How do we engage them in conversation when we have an opportunity? Maybe you have a, a, a relative that's in this particular sin. If you have an open door, you might be the only person that can tell them the truth. If you have an open door. Number one, remember that they are people made in the image of God. They're people made in the image of God with inestimable worth and dignity. They're not an enemy. They're not someone we hate. They're not someone we wish harm upon. 
They are people made in the image of God. We have to regard them as image bearers. Now, a lot of what I said, maybe even all of it, to many people will sound hateful. But, but I, don't, I don't agree with that. This is not hateful. Because if you love someone and you believe what the Bible says, you're going to love them enough to tell them the truth. You're going to love them enough to tell them the truth. I would be hating you if I said nothing. And I said, you're okay. God receives you. And that's hatred. That's hatred. Number two, remember, homosexual people or any other identity, they don't go to hell because they're homosexual. They go to hell because they're sinners like the rest of us. What I, what I mean by that is this. Just because someone is straight, it doesn't mean they're going to heaven. Even someone that detransitions, it doesn't mean they're going to heaven. And, and so when we engage people, we're not to just pinpoint this sin and bash someone over the head. They have to repent of all sin, like all of us. Be, because people in the LGBTQ community, guess what? They also lie. They also steal. They also cheat right? It's not one sin. That's one symptom. That's one symptom. And sadly, there are many Christians who stand in street corners and, and hate these people and point a finger and hold up signs. I don't know if you're familiar with the Westboro Baptists. I don't know if they still exist. It's those people that on YouTube, you can find it, they would stand with signs saying, God hates homosexuals. Homosexuals are going to hell. That's terrible. That's not Christian. Yes, we, we need to stand upon truth, but with compassion, with love, with care. Number three, with that in mind, as I said before, you must tell that person the truth. You must tell that person the truth in love. The truth will set the person free. You know, uh, some people uh, stuck in these sins, just like all of us, they say, well, God made me the, um, this way. That's not true. That's not true. He didn't make you that way. You were born that way, just like all of us. You were born in sin, and it just so happens that this is how your sin manifests itself, Right? But just like all of us, we cannot change our nature. What do they need? A new heart. What does the Bible say? God gives. A new heart. He regenerates. He frees from this. There are countless examples, countless testimonies of people that have come out of this through faith in Christ. Through regeneration. But we must tell them the truth. Number four, also, parents, grandparents, you need to speak to your children about these things. What I have said needs to be communicated in some way, at some point. And that's going to require wisdom, and it's going to be a different approach to every family. But if you don't instruct them on this, guess what? Someone else is. Someone else is. If you're not speaking to them, someone is. Who do you want them to learn it from? Teach them from early God's Word, His purpose in creation, in relationships, in marriage, and then model that for them at home. Show them a godly husband, a godly wife, a godly grandfather, a godly grandmother. Show them as you teach them. So often, myself included, I'll be the first to admit, our actions contradict our words. Number five, be intimately involved in your child's life as far as their friendships and schooling goes. Ask them questions. What are you learning at school? What did you learn today? Be intimately involved. And if something is off, it may require you to make a stand and go to the school and speak to them and voice your discontentment. We see that. Look on YouTube. There's many parents rising up, going to school boards. I don't want my children learning this from you. Number six, guard your children 
against all of this exposure. Guard your children against all of this exposure. Cartoons, books, places they go, things they see and hear. The world will tell you, well, you can't shield your children from all this. They need to be in the world and learn to grow and interact with the world. That's not biblical wisdom. We're to protect them. We are to instruct them and raise them up in the way of the Lord. Okay, That may require, hey, you can't have a tablet anymore. Hey, you can't watch the show anymore. Hey, you can't have those friends anymore. Hey, you're the parent. You get to do that. We are to protect our children. Guard them. One article said, no one is trying to corrupt your child. Really? Go to Walmart. Go to Kohl's. Go to Target. Number seven, adults, people with employment. Do not bow to the demands of this culture. If your employer comes to you or someone in, in your job says, you have to refer to me now as a he, they, or what, whatever's not appropriate to that person's sex, you must say, no, I cannot do that because of my biblical conviction. If I do that, it is a sin because it's a lie. I'm not going to affirm you in your deception because I love you and I want you to know the truth. You might lose your job. You might lose your job. But you need to stand up against this. I need to stand up against this. Number eight, don't fear. Don't fear. Don't fear what you see happening. Don't, don't fear government, things happening in the culture, because at the end of the day, as I mentioned before, God is in sovereign control. And the things that are always happening, they happen because He has allowed it to happen or He brought it about. And the Bible tells us as His children that He'll care for us, our families, our children. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. Do not fear. Fear is not of God. He's in control. He's in control. I and mean, we need to engage the culture with the gospel without fear. Without fear. Love casts out all fear. An illustration comes to mind. Ray Comfort. <laughs> Ray Comfort, he's like that tall. <laughs> he's like four feet something. And one time he, he uh, offended this guy that was like 6'5". And the guy was about to punch him. And his wife, who's like shorter than Ray Comfort is, jumped in front of him. What happened? Her love for her husband cast out the fear of the attacker. And if we love these people and all sinners, not just these people, all people, that's going to remove our fear. Love cast out fear. Love cast out fear. I was ha hoping I'd have more time to, to answer objections and alternate interpretations that people bring up with this. But we're almost out of time. I just want to say one common one. And I brought it up last week. A lot of people will say to you, holding up a Bible, Homosexuality is not a sin because Jesus never talked about homosexuality. That's true. Jesus, in the red letters, never mentioned homosexuality. Or he never mentioned child sacrifice either. He didn't mention a lot of things. Okay? And by the way, as I said last week, Jesus did talk about homosexuality where? In Romans 1, in Deuteronomy, in Leviticus. Because 2 Timothy 3.16 says what? All Scripture is what? Inspired by God. Who is Jesus? I and the Father are one. Before Abraham was, I am. Okay? And, and so this is why I don't like red letter Bibles. If we're going to do red letter, the whole thing should be read. The whole thing should be read. Because it's all the Word of God. It's all true. It's not Jesus' words, Paul's words, Peter's words. In a sense it is. But at the end of the day, the Bible has one author. God, okay? 
And by the way, Jesus did speak about marriage. Go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. In Matthew 19, verse 4 and 5, Jesus reaffirms God's design for marriage stated hundreds of years earlier. Thousands. And he answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Do you see that? An argument today is, we have, the 2,000 years since Christ, we have more science and knowledge. But hey, between the time Moses wrote Genesis and the account of marriage and creation of marriage, and Jesus, nothing had changed. He still defines it the same way. Right? Between one man and one woman. And look at, look at Jesus' affirmation of the sufficiency in, in, uh, of Scripture. Have you not read? Have you not read? It's in the Word. It's set in stone. If you're listening here this morning, and maybe you are part of this struggle, this sin, this church wants you to know that this is not a message of attack. This is not a message of hatred. This is not point pin, uh, pointing fingers. We want you to know the truth of the Gospel. And if you have not known Christ, you have not placed your faith in Christ, and you don't know how I can beat this sin in my life, you can't. But God can. Through regeneration through the new birth. He will give you a new heart and free you from this sin as with all other sin. And so if you've never trusted in Christ, the Bible says today is the day of salvation. Repent of your sins and place all of your faith in Christ. And Scripture promises that you will be saved. You will be forgiven. You will be redeemed. Because in 1 Timothy 6, or 1 Corinthians 6, to end here. Listen to what he says. 1 Corinthians 6. Let me read that again. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Don't be deceived, neither fornicators, adulterers, uh, idolaters, effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And then listen to, listen to what he says next. And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the Spirit of our God. Such were some of you. Such were some of all of us. We all come from a background of sin. God can free you through faith in Christ. Let's pray. Father, I come to you in your Son's holy name and thank you for your word that gives us clarity, hard message, hard truth, but it's your truth and we can't sidestep it, we can't redefine it, we can't reinterpret it. And Lord, our hearts do break for what's going on in the culture for individuals. And our desire is not for their harm, but for their salvation, their well-being, their forgiveness. But they must know what the illness is before they can treat it. So I pray this morning that maybe your spirit would have brought conviction upon someone's heart that this is a sin as all other sin, to be repented of. And in Christ, that person will find forgiveness, cleansing, and renewal, and eternal life. We thank you and pray all these things in the name of your Son. Amen.